We have Vicki Scatini on the line. Vicki, I appreciate you uh, giving us the time here today, but we're going to cover a ton of ground, especially from how you started off. And I think you said you started off with $478. I sure did. Thank you so much for having me. I am really excited to be here. Yeah. So before we say anything here, we want to make sure that you are able to find Vicki right away. Um, I know that you have a, a variety of ways to get a hold of you. I'm guessing your primary one is through your website, Vicki Scanetti, and and the last name is S C H E T T I N I dot com. But you're on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest. You have a book and a podcast. I do. I do. I have it all. I'm trying to get the word out and. And my mission is to help people that are willing to do wit, whatever it takes. I, I had a chance to retire two years ago, and what was I going to do? I, I just wanted to go, go and help those people. Like I said, I did start with $478, and somebody gave me a chance. So that's what my mission is now, to go out there and help the others. Sure. Well, let's start at that very beginning. $478. I have... There's so many people, especially starting out in real estate investing, that they ask themselves day in and day out, how do I get involved? I don't have any money. I mean, $478 doesn't sound like a lot, but you managed to get it to work. And how did, where did you start? Well, you know, I moved across country. My daughter had gone off to school and I was really having empty nest syndrome in California. She went to Louisiana. So I had this great idea. It was time to build my wealth now. And I moved across country. I had everything set. Uh, the owner was, I had a house ready. The owner was supposed to owner finance me. I get all the way to Jackson, Mississippi, and she disappears. The whole, mind you, the whole trip we're talking, the entire trip. I crossed over state line and I, she doesn't respond to me anymore. So because of all the issues I had on the way here, my money was just getting depleted and depleted and depleted. Well, I'm thinking this night that she just forgot, you know, her phone ran out of battery. She dropped it in the toilet. I think of all this stuff. Bottom line by the next day is I realized she's not calling me back. And I was, you know, I think I had about a thousand at that point. I went and I uh, moved out of this motel to a not so great motel and I got it for a week the minute I start walking through the door I hear somebody saying something about bed bugs I'm like what are bed bugs I didn't know what bed bugs were so I google them and I go and this thing is infested with bugs so not only did I start with $478 I was living in the back of my car and I call it the rock bottom night a fight broke out. I was, I was sleeping already in the back of the car. And the next thing I hear is gunshots. So at that time, like my whole life kind of flashed before me. And I realized, what am I doing here? I came here for a mission and I'm really not doing it. So the next day, you know, being in the back of the car when that's never happened to me, kind of depression sank in. And the next day I needed to change my mindset, but I couldn't get my mindset to change in the circumstances I was in. The only thing I kept coming to my head was getting a dog. So I go and I get a rescue dog and hearing his story at that day, I said, you know, I promised him that I was going to make sure that I would get us out of that situation. And in three days, three days, not only did I have one, I had two people that were willing to owner finance me a home for us. But really, how did I do it? Mindset and creativity. That's it. Mm -hmm. Well, let's say if you were in this situation again, and you had $500 getting into real estate investing for the first time, where, where would you start? You know, in, in this, you know, I was going through a divorce when I came here. So I would probably start back in Jackson, Mississippi or an area where the um, where the sales prices are lower and but the rents are high, if that makes sense. 
So I like to invest in B and C class area, meaning not the best, you know, in town, not the, you know, war zones, I'll call them, in between in the middle. I think I get the best return. And I was willing to do all the work in managing. So um, that's what I did. I know a lot of managers don't, property managers like to do only the A top areas and B. I like to do both because that's where I get my best returns. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. You mentioned that it takes a, a bit to, you know, it was hard to get out of that mindset because I think that seems to be a big struggle for a lot of people. Um, yeah. You're, I just, I mean, I really, until this night, I was in that back of that car for a few weeks, if not a month, I don't really remember how long it was, but um, I was doing nothing. I was just withering away back there. So it, it was my mindset that I had to do. And, you know, when the whole saying failure is not an option, it really is not. When you, when you are, um, have issues and you push through them, usually a majority, I would say 99% of the time, something great is on the other side. But that is when most people give up is when it gets difficult. And they'll, they'll go back to doing what they were doing before. But if you push through, learn how to do it, then it's a piece of cake because the next time you encounter that issue, you know how to solve it. Sure. So can you talk about like some of those strategies you use to, to kind of turn your mindset around when you're in that situation? Or what do you advise people today? I would, you know, with me, it was the dog. It, what works for me may not work for you. It's something that's going to motivate. You know, if I think if I had my daughter, my daughter would have been the motivating factor, but she had gone off to school. It, it's sad, but it's almost like my, the wife for just me wasn't strong enough. Like I wouldn't do it for just me, but I would do it for the dog. Oops, sorry. I would do it for the dog. I would do it for my daughter. So whatever it is that will, that gets you out of bed when you're tired, what is it that pushes your buttons? That is the same attitude you need to have. For me, I couldn't do it by myself. I needed to go get a dog to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. It's, it's amazing the different motivation it takes people to, to take that action. And, and if, if you can't do it for yourself, that's a, that's a great motivator. Yeah. I think, I think you know, in my situation, I mean, I looked at wanting to provide more for my my family whether it's financially or time yeah and and it's true i don't know why um i wouldn't i couldn't think i i just wasn't you know when depression sinks in you don't think normally you're in the pity me party mm -hmm. and i didn't see that i was in a pity me party because i was in it i was the only one at this party but it took till that night for that to happen for me to say what well, this is not me, you know, and, and keep in mind, I had a foreclosure. I had a bankruptcy. I didn't have good credit. I didn't have a job. I was new in town. So none of that mattered. I, once I decided that I was just going to do it and did I get hung up on? Yes, I did. I got, you know, laughed at, but in three days I didn't push. I just kept going. Somebody was going to help me and they did. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what, what do you typically advise your, your students? I know you do quite a bit of mentoring now. Like where, where do that you typically advise them to start? Like when it comes to real estate investing, like, are you, are they typically doing wholesaling, fix and flipping? I know I, you've done a little bit of everything. So it's, you know, I am more about passive income. Uh, I think wholesaling, it, it's great but I think you're doing too, way too much work for wholesaling. Um, fix and flips, if you're gonna be doing fix and flips, to me, you're gonna be hungry forever because by the time you get that one closed, the next one, you know, unless you're doing a lot consecutive, you're gonna be hungry because by the time you close, you have to pay bills already. So I'm all about the passive income. I like to do rentals and wraparound mortgages because mm -hmm. no matter where I'm at, if I'm sick, whatever the reason is, the money's still coming in. But if you're doing wholesaling and flips, 
which it, I'll do them because I have money coming in. But I would probably say, depending on what their goals are, if it is um, have a steady income coming in, then concentrate more on building the um, rentals or do wrapper on mortgages. Sure. Well, we're going to get into some of the information around, you know, how you kind of get into some of the weeds regarding how you, you find your rentals and, and run some of those numbers. But again, I just want to remind everybody, if you like what Vicki is saying and you'd like some additional help and detail, make sure you head over to her website. That's Vicki Scudetti. See, I already Scutini. messed it up. Scudini. <laughs> Scudini. She was pick, picking on me before the show regarding that. So it's uh, S-C-H-E-T-T-I-N-I dot com. Uh, for a lot of this information. And I know you have quite a few resources and a lot of free information through your podcast and your YouTube channel. So everybody make sure you check that out as well. And this is like actually perfect timing because I'm always doing uh, workshops. Well, there's one coming up on wraparound mortgages. And to me, that's like safe haven, even if the market, because you know, everybody's saying, and in some areas market has plateaued through COVID. But you can't go wrong with wraparound mortgages. So that's something that you need to learn how to do if they have not learned how to do them because I can't tell you how many deals I picked up because it wouldn't really work for a flip and um, wraparound mortgages was a way to do it. Sure. Well, we better define what a wraparound mortgage is because some of our listeners may not be familiar. So it's, it's having two loans literally being wrapped into one. If I bought a house with, let's say the owner is financing me, I have to pay the owner, but I can turn around and sell you that same house for a higher amount, for a higher interest rate. And then you pay me, I turn around, pay the owner, the original owner, and I keep the difference. Sure. And that's, so, that's a great one. Yeah. So, you know, and, and uh, that's becoming... Uh, more and more common uh, as a as a as a strategy. So, what are some of the benefits that uh, a person would see? You know, as a rental property, we have depreciation, appreciation, a, a few other benefits there. But there's some pretty significant benefits that you that you uh, may lose out on, but there's some that you're going to add as well. I mean, uh, one of them, one of the big ones I can think of is uh, maintenance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You don't have to deal with tenants. You don't, you know, the person who, and I like to do, sell it to other investors, make sure they have a profit. So it varies what you're trying to do. If, if I sell to investors, I get a higher down payment. So I'm actually getting probably more than what I would have made it if it was a wholesale deal. And now I'm continuously getting paid on it anyways and make sure that they have a profit. And if I sell to a homeowner that's gonna be living in a property, you have to be careful, Frank Dodd. There's a lot of regulations when it comes to that. It's different laws for people that are gonna live in the property. But with them, I just make it that it's the mortgage, it's less than what they would pay for rent if they were to live in that house. So you have a lot more people and you're not worried about enough you don't have to worry about leaky toilets, stuff that toilets or any of that. And if the people don't pay, you just take the property back and you do it again. I mean, realistically, where your worst case scenario is for me as an investor not paying, well, I just start collecting the rents, which I make more. Mm -hmm. It's a no brainer. Sure. So where, how do you uh, calculate those deals? Like if let's, do you have an example that we could walk through? Um, you know, I didn't have one prepared, but this is something that I do teach in the class. And, and one of the things by the end, because I don't stop till everyone really understands how to do it. And, and it's amazing how many people will come up at the end and they're like, wow, I didn't realize that, you know, I was just thinking about myself. And I'm like, yeah, when you put yourself how much money you're going to get first, you're more than likely going to lose either getting that purchase or selling it. The trick is this, I, I mean, I did a wrap that I was only making $67 for 15 years. 
And then after 15 years, my original loan was going to be paid off. I would have, it would, it became to be like a thousand dollars after not a big thing, 67, but throughout the next 30 years, I would have made a lot more. Well, think about it in a normal situation. Seller is willing to do owner financing. If you bid too low, somebody else like me will come in and probably give him the price that he wants if he's doing owner financing for me, or maybe even higher. So I'll go in, now you just lost a deal because you were trying to get it lower. And if you're trying to take get the most money being the middleman, because let's face it, that's what you are as a wraparound person, your buyer's not gonna buy it. If you have a person, let's say an investor, has 20% down, which deal are they gonna take? Obviously the one that gives them the best return on their money. Mm -hmm. If you're being greedy and you charge them too much and it's too tight for them, they're not gonna buy your deal. They're gonna come and buy my deal. And this is real life scenarios because you don't know what somebody else is offering people. So you, the way I do it is I, make, I want the owner financing. I don't have to qualify for loans. I don't, you know, sometimes I don't even put a down payment and it's much easier. There's no closing costs. There's no downtime. We literally can close in a day. Mm -hmm. So I'd rather them doing that, give them more and then make, but I always make sure that whoever I'm going to wrap it to, that they're always making a good return. So then that way, when they see my stuff coming by, that's the first one that they'll grab. Sure. So are you as the seller still getting a little piece uh, each month or is it, is it something that uh, you're, you're just basically collecting a wholesale fee of, of some kind? No, I'm getting paid monthly too. So they, my buyer pays me and I turn around, take my, and pay my seller and I keep the difference. $67 is what I made on a monthly basis for, that was the lowest deal I did. And, um, but I mean, there's been some that I make $200 and I don't have to worry about anything. And it adds up, it's only one deal. But keep in mind, usually the deal that I have with my seller is shorter term than what I sell it for. So at the beginning, I pull out the funds to pay my seller and I keep the difference. Eventually he's going to be paid off and it's all mine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if, if you're finding it hard to follow a lot of this, uh, I'd really encourage you to take a look at uh, what Vicki is saying. And, and I'm sure you're showing it in far more detail on some of your yeah. resources. So, um, and I can understand, especially those new to this concept, to struggle to understand what's going on here. But this, to put Here's things into perspective here is what Vicki is actually saying, too, is that uh, at least in my market or in a lot of markets, when you hold a rental property, you might be cash flowing a couple hundred dollars a month. However, okay. the refrigerator goes out and you've blown your, your cash flow for half the year. Um, what Vicky is suggesting is you're basically putting that responsibility on the owner or the resident and uh, acting as a bank to a certain extent. And, and in essence, you are, you know, and the way I like to explain it to people, think about your car because, you know, you can do it with cars. You can do it with anything. You have your car payment and your friend really, really wants your car. Let's say your car payment is $500 a month. They don't have a car and they don't have the credit. They don't have the money to go put down on a car. So you say, you know what? I have another car. I'll let you buy it for me and you can make me monthly payments. Give me 700 amount a month and 2000 down payment that they can do. They have a car. You're making money monthly and you make money up front too. Right. So, you know, you're talking about, let's talk about rental properties a little bit because, you know, I, I, you know, I don't know if you're in agreement with me, but I'm going to throw it out there. A lot of people have been taught the 1% rule and they kind of, that they kind of up, up and running. And, and I kind of want to revise, revise that a, a little bit. Um, what are your thoughts regarding how you analyze for a rental property? 
You know, I really, I look at ROI, return on investment. I have to be in double digits. If not, it's not worth it for me because mm -hmm. I know I can get quite a bit in double digits and preferably close, you know, to the, in the twenties. Um, but depending on the area, as long as it's in double digits, I, it doesn't really, I don't go off the 1% rule. Um, but I will tell you what, my first house, I was paying owner financing, paying 18% um, interest rate. And when I fixed it up and I sold it, I mean, I, I didn't sell it. I fixed it up and I rented it. I was making 650 a month. I didn't put any money down. So it's a no brainer. I just look at the deal because all deals are, are different. The more creative I get, I call them freebies. If I get a freebie, I really don't don't care. But um, even if that house would have been overpriced, it still made six hundred fifty dollars a month. So I can choose not to do it, or I do it and start making money monthly. I choose to do it. So I look at the what am I getting in monthly. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think what's really important there is what you're, what you're pointing out is the fact that almost any property can be seen as a good deal depending on how creative you can be with it and exactly. how receptive, receptive the seller is. I mean, I think uh, a lot of people, every, every problem, if, if you have a hammer, every problem is solved by just pounding it in, you know, you're, you're every, every problem or you know, you know the scenario there. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, uh, I get it. Yeah. So you, but what you really are saying is that you, you do have to get creative, and and that is many times like when we go take a look at a house or a property, where we offer the seller options. We don't give them just a cash option. We give them okay. other other options to solve their problems, so that they have something to choose from instead of it being just a yes or no scenario. And I, I do the same thing. I give them three options every single time. Yeah. My first two options is owner financing. The last one's a cash offer. How often would you say that they take the whole, the financing option? Um, I would say probably 50, 50 it. Now mind you, I'm in a market too, that there is a lot of properties, um, that are lost due to people not paying taxes. So mm -hmm. I work, I, I was lucky enough to have found the investors that invest in these tax deeds. So I, most of those people, a lot of the times they just want the return. So Mississippi pays 18% return on tax deed properties. I give them the same thing. I think if I was going to the regular homeowners and people selling, I don't know if I would get that high of a return, but I was just lucky enough to find people that just are looking for the interest rate. Right. So when you're, when you're going and talking to these sellers, like what, how does that conversation typically look? You know, I just build a rapport. I ask the very first thing is I ask them why they're selling and let them talk, let them um, feel comfortable. And, you know, I always tell my students, ask the question. And even if there's awkward silence, you need to just be quiet. <laughs> let the people answer it. So then that way, the more they talk about themselves to you, the more comfortable. And even if somebody's offering a better deal, more than likely they're gonna want you to get it because they like you. So I asked them what is their why and identify with them whatever the reason is that relate with them to be able to feel that, that comfort. Then I prepare the three offers that will solve their whys. Right. So the whole idea of solving their whys. I know what my why is. I don't know their why. Yeah, exactly. You know, to give good examples of this is, you know, we had a, we had not a, you know, I've, I've shared this story a mul multiple times on, on the show, but we, we had a situation where a family just uh, 
the elder passed away and and now the family is dealing with kind of a hoarder house um, oh, wow. and you, then you have then you have uh people who still have some sentimental items in the, in the house but unfortunately the family isn't getting along so you you let them talk and let them understand what's so you understand what's going on so one of the options that we presented is is that they were free to tag whatever antiques or items in the house that they needed or wanted and then we would deliver them so the family could, family could avoid those confrontation that confrontation and that was enough you know some of that type of thing is enough to to make it worthwhile for them and that's it i mean you you see what's going on and you're just solving a problem people just don't get up and say you know what i'm just gonna sell my house today there's a reason that motivates them to just actually go and do it and it's your job to find the reason and solve it Mm -hmm. If you solve the reason, then majority of the times it, it works. Now, it works better too. Now with COVID, it's a little bit harder when you do it in person. Mm -hmm. I like to present my offers in person. But, um, you know, now with COVID, I, you know, I do everything with videos. Right. How do you feel that it's important to have an offer like ready right then and there? Like something or, or do you... Uh, is it uh no no i i because i need really need to get to know them and majority of the times i don't even go look at the house i go off what they say um and if it's completely off then what they've told me over the phone then i renegotiate later but i just really really listen to them and i go in with an offer a thought out offer that really solves their problems and I tell them how, okay, on this off an offer, I had one scenario, the husband had gotten remarried. The, they wanted to live in the country. He was still going to travel, but she was going to not work. Now they needed to build another bathroom in the, in the house. First offer had a lower down payment because I knew he was mechanical. It would have given him enough to buy the materials. He could do the work. Second offer was for him to call a company and build that bathroom. And then the third offer, offer was a cash offer, which is the lowest out of all. So just really each offer has to make sense, tie it back into their why. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So there, there we've, we've uh, been covering quite a bit of content here today, but I uh, wanted to call out a few things that we, we've learned from our, our conversation. But before I do, what, uh, if, if I always ask this question, is there a question you wished I would have asked today? No, actually, I think we did really, really good. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like to give people different options because everybody teaches you wholesaling. Everybody teaches you flipping. No, because if you get sick, you're going to go hungry. So it, to me, it's about the residual income and making sure you build it strong and then the money starts coming in. Sure. So uh, I just wanted to call out a few things from our conversation because there was quite a few things that, that uh, are action items here that uh, Vicki has, uh, has brought up. Um, the first thing is, I think I think it's a great exercise and something that we haven't visit, revisited in, in quite a while is that individually we have to understand and review our why. Why are you doing this and how you're going to get, what's going to motivate you to, to do this? Whether it's for yourself, if, that's, um, if you can self-motivate, more power to you. But most of us have an underlying why and we you have to have to identify that and make sure that it's uh it's enough to to get yourself moving um really liked your strategies around the wraparound mortgages and and that can be a pretty complicated thing and i think we could have probably spent an entire episode on that um but uh again make sure you head over to vicky and the last name is s-c-h-e-t-t-i-n-i.com for more information 
uh, because I, th I think you have quite a bit of material out there for people and uh, they can probably even get you up for additional information and coaching there. Um, when you're talking to those sellers, how important it is to build those relationships. And, and I think it's very interesting that you really build that relationship strong enough that you even, you start to, I mean, you even trust what they're telling you about their house and base much of your, your offer on that. I mean, that, that's remarkable. I mean, if you're building a relationship to that depth in a relatively short amount of time, uh, that's saying a lot. Um, and you're doing something right. If you're, if you're at about 50, 50 on them picking the, uh, the, one of the other options where it's not the cash option, that's, that's remarkable as well. Ours, ours frankly is considerably less than that, <laughs> but I think it matters too in the area because you have to think the prices here are lower. So it's also harder to get loans on these houses. No, well, we're sure. not at a hundred thousand, so that makes a big difference too. Yeah, but I can see where that strategy could really work out in in other scenarios. You know, I yeah. recently talked to somebody who does something similar for uh, trailer houses. You know, and I know that's a that's a very different class of of property. I, I guess it's it's more class like a vehicle, actually, in my part of the world. But um, but it's a similar situation. Yeah. I mean that, um, but I really appreciate your time today. I, I'm going to make sure to include all of the show notes, links to in the show notes to your website, your YouTube channel, your podcast. Definitely make sure you check out her podcast and uh, the Wit Academy, uh, whatever yes, it takes. I, I did go check it out. So I'm really, really excited. And we'll be talking Maybe you can come on to my show. Oh, I'd love that. That'd be great. Love it. We'll go well, ahead thank and you, set Vicky. something up. Thank uh, you, Vicky. I hope we can do this again. Yeah, bye. All right. Sounds good.